Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of You Press Play Sports. I'm your host and sports editor, Richard Pereira. Joining alongside, my, uh, alongside me today is photo editor, Essen Parker, and contributing and staff writer, actually, Kevin Garcia. Hello, everybody. How are we doing? Doing pretty well. How about y'all? Doing fantastic. All right. That's good to hear. Uh, we'll start off today with FEU football. While they didn't play this past week because they were on a bye week, they pretty much completed the first half of the season, and they will start the second half of the season on Thursday, October 21st, or 21st, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 21st yeah. against the Charlotte 49ers. Uh, they didn't do too good in the last game they played, losing to UAB on the road. And while FAU is undefeated at home, they still haven't, they still have yet to achieve a victory on the road. So guys, what does FAU have to do to take, get taken an advantage, an early, a good early start against Charlotte on Thursday? Well, the biggest thing here for me is the run game. Charlotte, particularly their defense is particularly weak against the, uh, the rush. They're ranked 127th in the nation right now against the rush. They're giving up something like, I think in total, they're giving up like 400 yards a game. And majority of that is coming from the rushing standpoint. Hmm. And uh, yeah, I think FAU, our rushing game has been particularly good this, this, uh, this season. And I think that's the main thing they have to focus is going there and getting on the run because we know in Kosi Perry and our backup, Nick Tronti is also a backup quarterback. Both guys are banged up after their last game. So rushing the ball is going to be a crucial thing that they need to do, and they need to establish that from the beginning. And going off of what you said, Kevin, I think another way that FAU can get an advantage, especially early on, is getting to the quarterback, uh, Chris Reynolds for Charlotte. Against FIU, well, when Charlotte played FIU on the 8th, um, um, Chris Reynolds did the game. He threw for four touchdowns and no if he can you know pressure him and force him or enforce which our defense has done a pretty good job of so far i had definitely give us early advantage to start um also once you know if i played them pretty well and grant it is an away game um been oh we play you. I think that we have a pretty good shot. Yeah, and I have to agree with that. The rushing game for FAU is one of their best strengths, especially with Johnny Ford when he's back up to full strength. So having a running game, a solid running game against Charlotte will be absolutely crucial. Uh, as we move on from football, we have FAU soccer to talk about, and we'll start off with the men's and. Unfortunately for the men's, they've been uh, hitting a rough patch uh, the past week. Uh, on Against Marshall on October 9, uh, Marshall was ranked number five in the nation, our defending champions in the NCAA soccer. And uh, FU lost 3-0, which was, well, our expectations were low, but our hopes were very high. So losing 3-0, well, was a tough pill to swallow. And it, it got even worse as we lost to Stetson on October 12 on Tuesday, 1-0. And to top it off, a 5-1 defeat, home defeat, in fact, to Charlotte, 5-1. So, Esten, it's been getting kind of rough for FE men's soccer lately. What do you think they got to do to bounce back from that? Um, I think one of the main things is I mean, we saw it against Charlotte the other day. Um, they got to defend better. I mean, allowing 16 shots and 11 on target is tough. Um, yeah. And, you know, allowing five goals, it's it, 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 it was rough. It, it was a rough game. Um, and like you said, we've been on a rough patch. And, and I wonder if, you know, their confidence has been completely busted, you know, after losing Marshall and now dropping two games that, these last two games arguably are games that they, well, especially against Charlotte, they could have played much better. Um, I think there's no question about that. But um, I think one of the things they got to do is just kind of 
you know, bring, get back to what they were doing really well, which was attacking proficiently and efficient, well, more efficiently than anything, um, and spreading the ball out and getting the creative players um, like uh, Alice Tui and Mikolenko and Philip Jocht and um, uh, Alonzo to get more opportunities. So hopefully again, CUAB, they can snap or at least get just confidence back up towards the end of the season. I pretty much have the same thoughts here, Reston. And um, yeah, um, I'm pretty sure I have, I still have faith in the team. And, you know, they, they will head on the road to Birmingham, Alabama on Saturday, October 23rd, as they take on UAB, who is at the bottom of the conference. So it should be a winnable game for FEU, and it should be a, a good bounce back performance for, for them. Going on a more positive note, we head on to women's soccer, who who got past Marshall in an, in a double overtime victory, a three two victory in fact, as it allowed them to qualify for the Conference USA tournament. Um, so, with the women's team now in the tournament, um, how do you think they should keep going as their as conference play uh, gets draws to a close in the next few weeks? Um, I think they, I mean, this is a very general answer, but they need to keep up the momentum. I mean, um, since their loss to Florida Gulf Coast on the 12th of last month, they've only lost one game. Um, and, you know, they're a resilient team. They have, since that loss to Florida Gulf Coast, they've had, um, they've had four games go to overtime. And they've won two of them and had a draw in two also. Um, and they've shown that they can win away games as well as, you know, uh, taking points away from home. Um, I mean, they beat UTEP on the ninth and coming or going up against Western Kentucky, I think will be tough, you know, since it's an away game. But I think that they can end strong. And if they do, that should really propel them going into the going into the conference tournament. And yeah, like best of luck to them as conference play goes to draws to a close in the next two weeks. And their next game will be against Western Kentucky, who is at close to the top of the conference, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. So it's gonna be a tough match for them on the road, particularly. So best of luck to them and hopefully they can keep up the momentum. And that will draw uh, conclude our section with FU Sports. Now we move on to the NFL. Um, the past two weeks have been quite eventful for NFL fans lately. And for some of us, uh, we've had some tough luck. Uh, for me, the Patriots losing to Cowboys. Uh, for Kevin, the Giants losing. No, we're not going to talk about that. And the most uh, drastic one of all, uh, the Jaguars beating Eston's Miami Dolphins. So guys, uh, what went down that... <laughs> Uh, damaged, uh, <laughs> damaged our teams. Man, I, I turned off the Giants game like 10 minutes in. Well, once it started getting out of control, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to torture myself. Like, it's not worth watching. There, all of our wide receivers were gone. Literally, our, our three starting wide receivers were gone. Yeah, still Saquon Barkley. Daniel Jones had nobody to throw to. He could have thrown to one of us. That's about as good as he could have gotten. Like, that, that game was just... Yeah, it was not worth the time of watching. It just wasn't worth it. Um, yeah, I, I think for the Dolphins, I can hear JP laughing from Chicago because of how bad that game was. Um, it was, uh, let, let's put it this way. And this was with Tua, not Jacob B. Brissett. It, Tua. Mm -hmm. Tua. And Oof. we were without, so we were without Devontae Parker, which, you know, it's tough, but they're still receipt like talented players on that roster. Um, just could not put it together. A, a, ter a terrible call on fourth down at the end of the game to run the ball. It's Malcolm Brown that gives the Jaguars good field position to allow them to win the game. And, you know, just a mini rant here. The Dolphins were without Byron Jones and Xavier Howard. 
our best cornerback was a first round bust in Noah Igbenogany, who, by the way, it was his first game this season. And he just got absolutely destroyed by, um, I forget the name of the receiver for the Jaguars, but I mean, um, we just could not play defense very well. It, it's, it's bad. It, it's bad. So, some, something's got to give. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kevin, uh, any thoughts on uh, what happened with the NFL games the past two weeks? Oh, man. Can we talk about John Gruden for a second? Oh. Like, like, that, like, that's the biggest story in the NFL, right? Just overall, <laughs> like, reactions, thoughts, like, just, wow. You know, it's, it's, it was something, like, that I just caught everybody by surprise, right? It, it definitely did caught everyone by surprise, especially if he's, uh, with all this, like, being emails and it's very offensive. And if one, if the one comment about Roger Goodell is the least offensive out of all of them, then you know you messed up. And it, it made absolutely all the more sense for the Raiders to let go of Reed, Gruden. And it, it was just... It was just a chaotic event for NFL, for the NFL. So, but yeah, Kevin, what are your thoughts on that in general? Uh, I was, I, I was, um, I was like, I don't want to say that I wasn't surprised, but you, you hear these things about John Gruden that he's a tough guy and all this and that, and then to see the emails come to light, it's like, my my question is, who's next? What's the next organization? Because people were saying, like, I was reading articles about this, and sources were saying that, like. John Gruden is not the only one that has these thoughts and says these things. The NFL, this this is like a more of a gaping hole in their philosophy. And hopefully this brings out change in the way they operate and the people they employ in power. That's the only thing I can hope for, really. It's just, it's sad to see um, the, the Raiders fan base. They had a love-hate, mostly hate relationship with John Gruden anyway. So I'm sure they're happy to see him go. But it's just <laughs> a really bad look for the NFL overall. And I think another really concerning part is Gruden felt comfortable enough to send those emails, not only to, was it Dan Snyder of the, well, now Washington football team. I don't think Snyder's with the organization anymore. No, it, it was, uh, it was it, Bruce he, Allen, the, their former okay. general manager. Okay. Thank you. So they, if he felt comfortable sending those emails to Bruce Allen, I, I think that there's no way that there wasn't any more that he sent to other executives, players, or you know, anyone within other organizations. And Kevin, like you said, um, there's no way that Gruden is the only person. That there's there's got to be more people that have said these things. It's And it's, it's only a matter of when more people or, you know, similar cases get, you know, leaked out rather than if. And, and it's a problem, but I, I think that, that the league and teams are hopefully starting to take some action towards it, but we'll see how that plays out. So, Yeah. Uh, as Essen said, we'll have to see what happens from here. And uh, moving on from that, um, our last topic for today is the NBA. Uh, with the preseason having concluded and the regular season is about to start on Tuesday as the time of this recording on a Monday, so guys, uh, who are our players to for our preseason awards? Uh, we'll start off with MVP. Who is the player we are expecting to go for that award this season? So I, I have it down to three guys, but if I had to pick one, I would say Kevin Durant. I, I just feel like Kevin Durant is going to have a good year. If he's healthy, he's going to have an MVP year, I think. There's going to be no Kyrie. We don't know what's going to be there with James Harden. The Brooklyn Nets are essentially going to be Kevin Durant, and, you know, some, some bench guys, Blake Griffin, Paul Millsap, and we'll see what they get from Harden. But, yeah, I think KD is going to have a big year. And I, I could also see Giannis being back in the conversation after he won the championship. And then Steph oh, yeah. Curry as well is going to be in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Aston, what do you think? Uh, Kevin, uh, I'm with you on a lot of the players you mentioned. Another guy I'm thinking of is Trey Young mm -hmm. um, for a possible MVP candidate. I mean, they – Atlanta took off after they fired their coach or the coach that started the season with them last year. And if they can keep up that momentum and continue like, like, and just make progress from where they were last year, it could be a dangerous team. 
Um, and I guess another player besides Steph and KD that I think could maybe make a run towards MVP, well, and Giannis, of course, um, is maybe someone like Jason Tatum. I mean, I, I still think he's got – Richard, I, I know you're probably loving this. I, I, I think he's still an elite yeah, I am. player. Yeah, I am. <laughs> and he can – and I think he has that ability to be a top 10 player in the league if he's not already. And if he can carry that team, which I think he's capable of, and Boston has a very solid team, um, I, I think Tatum can make a run this year too. So, And, yeah – while my expected favorite is going to be honest, like after all, he is the defending champion. He is leading his Bucks to like enormous amounts of success, especially throughout the past season. And this season, he's defending it. He's going for the repeat. And yeah, Giannis is my expected favorite for the MVP. And my dark horse pick, as Esten said, is Jason Tatum. And Tatum, he just keeps getting better and better every year, man. And uh and this is a this should be a season where the Celtics are slightly under the radar, but they can really make a, a a deep run should everything go as planned for the team. And uh, and those are pretty much my main picks for MVP. So, what players outside of the MVP conversation are we expecting to make a huge leap this season outside of the MVP conversation? Okay, can I say this real quick? It's funny that we didn't even mention the reigning MVP, Nikola Jokic, in the conversation at all. Uh, he's definitely going to be up there. But yeah, I think uh, Tatum is a good a good shout too. A guy that could that's going to evolve his game. I would say that's probably like one of the guys that I would focus in on. And then Luca too. Luca would be in that conversation, I think, as well for the majority of the season. Essen, uh, who do you think will make a huge leap this season? Um, I'm hoping as a Heat fan that Tyler Hero can actually continue this momentum into the regular season and be able to shoot like he did in the finals um, <laughs> and shoot like he has been in the preseason. Maybe he can also play some defense too. That'd be great. Um, but I, I think Luca is going to continue to, you know, be that guy. Um, and and I, another player I think that can make a big jump is RJ Barrett for the Knicks. Mm, yeah, um, good pick. I mean, good shout. I think yeah, I see. Him. I think that. I think I see him as the most improved. That's, that's a. Mm -hmm, definitely, I I think he's a probably one or two for that um for that award. So look out for him. Yeah, I agree. Uh, R.J. Barrett for most improved player. It it would make us. It, it's a logic. It's a sensible choice, and I think he should make a huge leap this season. And uh, the sixth man of the year, uh, I really want to see Derrick Rose win it. <laughs> Like, Me too. Like, I really want to see him winning. Like, he was very solid for the Knicks last season. He did very well in the playoffs. Like, whether it was him coming off the bench as a six-man or as a starter in some games, like, he shows he can still produce and get buckets. So, seeing him in the running for the six-man of the year award, that would be that would be great for him. Uh, all this Knicks talks brings a smile to my face. I appreciate it. All the praise here. <laughs> Yeah, Kevin, uh, the Knicks should actually be good this year. So, like, being in the top four in the East, that, that should be a good year for New York. What a tie to be a Knicks fan. It's been a long time since we've been, we've been good, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, well, and with that, that will conclude our episode on U-Press Play Sports. Be sure to hit like and subscribe. Uh, make sure to hit the, the bell for, to keep up with notifications from us. And to follow us uh, on social media, for me, it's at Rich26Pereira. For Esten, it's at Esten Parker. And last but not least for Kevin, it's at KevinGar658. And uh, also to be sure to keep in touch with uh, upressonline.com to keep up with news and sports and other content, all other kinds of content alike. And that will be it for today. And uh, have a great day.